Hello, listeners, and welcome to a very special edition of Film Swap. I am sitting in the front seat of an automobile with the ecstatic gaucho himself, Mr. Jonathan Pritchard Barrett. Now, normally we talk over the internet, don't we, Jonathan? We do. But today we are actually together in person, and we are sitting in the parking lot just outside the Odeon Cinema in Epsom, Surrey. And the reason why is because it's the 22nd of November, 2023. And today, a little something out of the ordinary is that we've come to actually see a brand new film on its opening day. And that film is, of course, Ridley Scott's much anticipated epic blockbuster, Napoleon. And uh, we are gonna go in in just a few minutes into the cinema and we're going to watch the film together and then we're going to go back to my place and we're going to sit and have an in-depth discussion about our thoughts and observations about watching the film. And we are also going to compare and contrast it with the very legendary silent film of, from 1927, Abel Gantz's classic, Napoleon. And we're a film that came out nearly 100 years ago. It's like, what about... 1928, I think it was. 1927. Yes, yeah, so we're looking at a film that is in just a few years will have its 100th anniversary. So we're going to talk about the two films together, both epic blockbuster films of their time, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, comparing and contrasting them and seeing uh, what they're like compared to one another. So sit back uh, folks and uh, get your ears ready because we're going to go in now and we're going to watch the film and then uh, we'll be back to talk about napoleon verse napoleon <laughs> napoleonic wars that's right the napoleonic wars so listeners sit back and enjoy we'll be right back in just a moment after the uh, cool intro <laughs> Bloody adverts. <laughs> Here is a motion picture film. Let's tidy up this tangle of film by putting it on a reel. at uh, my place in uh, leafy Surrey in England and uh, we've come back from the cinema haven't we Jono? We have. And uh, we just came back from seeing Ridley Scott's Napoleon on its opening day and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that and we're also going to talk a bit about something that we saw also in the cinema back yes. in 2012 wasn't it I think? 2013 I think. Was it? Okay. That's according to Wikipedia. Okay. okay. Well, it, then it must be must be true then. <laughs> but we um, we went to see Abel Gantz's Napoleon uh, at a down at South Bank in London, yeah. and uh, they had the the full sixty piece orchestra conducted by Carl Davis, who was the uh, the chap who uh, who did the current score that's on the Blu-ray. And he's a very famous composer for silent film. He's worked a lot with Ken, uh, Kevin Brownlow. Yeah. Uh, and we also met Kevin Brownlow that night, didn't we? Do you we remember? sort of half met him, half stalked him. <laughs> <laughs> he slightly yes. looked at us like... Like we were a couple it. of nutters, a couple of like proper film nerds. <laughs> and we, yes, we had, so after we attended this screening, that was like a good, 
what it must be. It's what about a six hour film, but they had sort of like lunch yeah. breaks and things. So it was like an all day thing, wasn't it? It kind of started oh, yeah. it in the afternoon and went in well into the evening. Yeah. And then, um, and it was wonderful and it was amazing. Uh, and then at the end of it, um, we went to the BFI bar, the little, you know, bar that they have at the front of the, uh, uh, the NFT. Well, it used to be called the NFT. I don't think they well, call it that anymore, do they? They don't. No. Mm. It's the BFI South Bank now, I think. Yeah. But uh, it was called NFT back then. And uh, so we went to the bar, and then sure enough, Kevin Brownlow came in with a colleague of his, and, uh, and we, I got him to sign a copy of his book. Uh, about Napoleon and uh, we had a little chat with him and he did look he was a bit wary of us I think because we and also his it was quite loud in there and obviously because he's he's um, you know more elderly now he maybe his hearing wasn't as good so he kind of kept kind of going what hey pardon <laughs> what like this every time you know especially me because I have quite a low voice so every time I asked him a question he kind of went hey what <laughs> Well, like this, and so, but anyway, but he was very uh, gracious, he was. and he and he signed my book, and he did spend a couple minutes chatting with us, yeah, and uh, and it was a really cool experience, and it's quite an amazing film. Do you think um, should we should should we start with that? Because chronologically, do you think it would be better yes. to just to, to talk about Abel Gantz's Napoleon first, and then build up to the big. The premiere film that we watched today. Good idea. Before we start, I'd like to talk a little bit about attitudes to Napoleon. Okay. Because I've done a little bit of research on this. And well, I that's found... quite important, and especially because the two films show quite different views of him, don't they? They do. They come across they completely different in the way that they present Napoleon. Exactly. So and Napoleon is... Um, so you, uh, YouGov, which is the sort of polling company, large polling company, they have uh, d they did some research in September on, okay. uh, to tie in with the film. Basi basically, um, they have been looking at attitudes in the UK, France, and around Europe. Mm. And the interesting thing is, uh, they said in uh, France, there's a generally positive uh, attitude to um, uh, Napoleon, where 34% uh, percent of people think he's uh, good, and uh, whereas only 12% of people in the UK think he was good. Um, where And well, funny enough, Germany and Denmark, Sweden, they're all 13% as, as well, so quite low. Yeah, right. um, and the, uh, so whereas uh, thinking he's, I haven't, people have an unfavorable view of him, it's uh, in France it's just 22, and 36 in the UK, 43% uh, in Germany. Wow. Yeah. And, um, for, now, and obviously a lot of the, those attitudes could be historical because obviously really. France was effectively invading all these countries. Germany. <laughs> yes. The countries that became Germany, yeah. Yes, exactly. yes. So, so obviously there, there's some historical kind of biases that will feed into people's attitudes towards these historical figures. Absolutely. And uh, it's quite interesting that the, because I, uh, I watched it over, because it's quite long, it's like about six hours long or sort of five and a half hours long. Yeah. The Abel Gantz's Napoleon I watched, um, on the BFI Blu-ray uh, over three nights. Right. Well, on Sunday it was more than the afternoon, and I kind of watched about an hour of it, and then went off and, you know, did, did some stuff with my kids and stuff, and then came back and watched the remainder of the second disc. Yeah. But basically it was, I watched it over three nights, and the one thing that struck me about it was the fact that it does present Napoleon as this great heroic figure yeah. in this great man who who and and it treats him like a, as a revolutionary yeah who was like trying to unite europe which is a, for me is a bit problematic the idea of uniting great populations of people through bombing them and killing them and well them. interestingly <laughs> the, one of the questions that they asked uh, in france uh, was was napoleon a champion of the french revolution hmm. or it or its betrayer Mm. And uh, more a champion was 31%, more of a portrayer, uh, 16 and neither uh, and uh, don't know were like sort of 24, 28 percent. Oh, quite, quite so, a lot. Yeah. So most people, more people in France think he is a champion of the ideals than any other group. 
Well, that's really quite interesting. It is, and it, and it explains why the film very much uh, takes that that view that it presents him as this great heroic figure who who championed, uh, yeah, you know, a, for a, for yeah, exactly for know. you know, and sort of uh, was a liberator of populations. Yeah, and. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the thing about Napoleon, because of its great girth as a film, even as it is, it actually only covers the very uh, early part of his life. It basically covers uh, his childhood, and then it covers it, his first major sort of victory, if you will, which was the Battle of Toulon, yeah. which is also covered in the Ridley Scott film, yep. which we'll talk about a bit later. And it also then covers his uh, uh, campaign in Italy. And then there's a little section in between where they spend, and, and to me it was kind of the weakest part of the film was the bit uh, with his romance with Josephine. Right. And that bit is quite almost sort of comical to me, I found it, because it's like uh, all throughout the film he's presented as this quiet, brooding figure who's a genius and who just sits back and watches everyone and then goes, no, no, no this is actually what we should do and this would be better. Uh, but then there's this sort of segment of the film where he's romancing Josephine and then all of a sudden he's portrayed as this, you know, sort of giddy puppy dog right. <laughs> who's, who's sort of fallen all over himself. And, yep. uh, and that little section of the film I, I found was probably the, the weakest link right. in what is otherwise a quite an, an amazing spectacle and quite an amazing sort of... Um, uh, you know, interesting thing to watch and to it's experience. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Just on the sheer the technical innovation and the, the the extraordinary spectacle of it all is just and and it was all made in in sort of the mid twenties when mm. there was no computer cartoons, no animation or artificial intelligence to create all these big mammoth battle scenes. They literally did all this stuff. Yeah, you know. Um, uh, to great effect in this film, um, and it's really quite amazing. Just it is. quite amazing. When I watched it, I was thinking, this is like a sort of MTV ident, <laughs> you know. Yes. It's basically a sort of some sort of art student has just thrown the book at it, done every single yeah. crazy technique they could possibly think of. Yeah. But actually, they came up and he came up with it in the twenties before, sort of, well, you know, way before, before anyone. Before he basically, else. it's extraordinary, especially the editing, because there's all this really rapid cutting. Yeah. And all these things that have this really extraordinary emotional impact, as a, like for instance, the scene towards the beginning when the, with the big snowball fight Epic. with all the boys. And this is the first, it shows the first, uh, and apparently all this was based on actual historical events that are, yeah. have been recorded, but he was uh, basically, they used to have these annual big snowball fights amongst all the boys. They'd break into teams and have these big mammoth snowball fights. And then the boys who showed particular courage or great, ingenuity in their strategy and things would be rewarded and of course napoleon excelled at this and so they have this mammoth uh, incredible sequence with these boys having this massive snowball fight with like you know there's sort of like 50 kids and they're all running around mm. but then there's these moments where they have the, these rapid cutting techniques where they have close-ups and crowd shots and snowballs and just uh, very um, very expressionist and very uh, very very effective in in terms of, of creating this emotional sort of resonance that's in this scene and he yeah. uses it to great effect in some of the battle scenes and things as well so and some of the bits when he meets Josephine and he's all like oh yeah. she's so lovely and you know, and then uh, you know they have uh, the, these incredible montages of images, yeah. and they all cut really quickly, and um, so it's amazing. And they did all these, um, like a lot of the supplements on the BFI, which folks you really should go and grab yourself a copy if you can. The BFI has a lovely triple disc set with with the film, uh, and then it has a whole wealth of supplemental features. And uh, one of them is a, a documentary that was made by Ken, Kevin Brownlow in the 60s for BBC. 
and it uh, shows kind of a little bit of behind the scenes and talks about some of these innovations. But, you know, back in these days, the cameras, these 35 millimeter cameras were like, you know, they were massive. just massive, great big, huge things. But these guys actually developed these kind of gurneys and uh, pendulum things and, yes. uh, and these sort of uh, tracking devices so that they could do these amazing tracking shots. And this is at a time when films generally were pretty static in terms of yeah. uh, because of the bulk of the equipment and the, and the limitations of being in the studios and stuff. The f films were generally relatively static, they were. you know, up to a point. But this film has incredible, incredible sequences where there, you know, there's a bit when he's on the ocean in the boat when he's escaping from Corsica. And and the camera is literally swinging like a pendulum through this thing. And they kind of intercut it with these scenes in the convention when they're, you, yes. know, uh, ta you know, when the revolution is just sort of kicking off in France. And they... They have these incredible sequences with the, the cameras swaying back and forth. And then it's intercutting between the crowds of people yelling and him in the ocean on, in the, you know, with these big waves and things. And it's just an incredible sequence, just incredibly engaging and yep. powerful piece of filmmaking. And, and it's just extraordinary. It's yeah, extraordinary. it is. It's absolutely, it's an explosion of creativity. It absolutely was. I told you, you said that to me uh, yesterday, and I said, save it for the podcast. <laughs> save that save that comment for the podcast. It was an explosion of creativity, and it definitely was. And, and Abel Gantz, because the film, um, I guess to go back to what I was originally going to say, was about the fact that the film only covers the, the first sort of section of his life, yeah. and it was actually meant to be. Uh, part of a planned series of sort of five or six films. Yeah. So there was, so if, when you consider the fact that this thing was sort of six hours long, actually, uh, apparently in its original preview version or premiere version in Paris, it was seven, over Nine. seven yeah, hours long. Right. Yeah. Really? Something like that. But it was a massive thing. Yeah. And, um, but apparently this was only supposed to be the start of, uh, five or six film yeah. series. So had he actually, you know, gone in depth in all these films in, in to, to the extent that he did in this first one, and had he been able to complete the the plan as it was intended, you would have ended up with like sort of like a 36-hour <laughs> film that would have really gone in depth about Napoleon's whole life yeah. and career right up to the end. But I think um, the the interesting thing was that because this film is only the first bit, it does really portray him in a very positive light yeah. as a great hero of France and, and yep. of Europe, yep. and that he was this great revolutionary and a genius tactician yep. and, uh, and uh, all this stuff. But pre apparently the his plan going forward would have covered the decline as well and would have gone yeah. into a bit more of the more controversial aspects of his uh, career and his yeah. life. Yeah. Well, his, uh, it's, it's a fascinating film. I mean, Napoleon himself is such a fascinating character. Hmm. And um, sort of since watching that film got me really interested in Napoleon. Uh, earlier hmm. in the year, I listened to a book uh, on, uh, on him, Napoleon the Great, which is, uh, and it just, I mean, he's, he's, he, is, he was a genius, really, and mm. um, he was an extraordinary amount of energy, and um, he's a very, very, very bright, and uh, yeah, he, he's... And, and the charismatic side of it as well, because if you very think about it, it takes a lot to... Incredible. I mean, I, I've never understood this concept of how people somehow get talked into dressing up in uniforms and going out into the middle of a field and all hacking each other to bits and <laughs> blowing each other up and, you know, do, do, you know, walking in straight lines and letting themselves get shot and things like that. I don't really understand why anyone would willingly participate in such things. But clearly he somehow inspired and, and uh, led people to yeah. do these things. And he, he was, was very charismatic. That's one of his yeah. key char characteristics as well. He could have been bright and a brilliant tactician, but mm. without his charisma, he would have basically been stuck. 
Yeah. I think. But but neither of the films, I mean, I don't know how much they capture his charisma, really, in the sense, because Abel Gantz's film very much portrays him as this, I mean, it's a silent film anyway, so we yeah. don't get to hear him speak, but he is very much portrayed as this brooding, quiet figure who kind of stands looking at everyone, sort of like, you know, you fools, yeah. let me tell you where it's really at. And he's sort of, you know, uh, kind of is portrayed in that way that you wouldn't sort of necessarily think that the guy is very personal <laughs> or, or is necessarily someone who would, you know, can um, be conducive to making a lot of friends and no. influencing He's people. He's more of a romantic stuff. character at the beginning and mm. he only becomes sort of this charismatic leader um, sort of really as time goes on and it's, mm. he just gets to the beginning of that part of his story in uh, Abel Gantz's uh, version, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. Which is, yeah, it's a shame because you sort of wonder, yeah, it's a sort of transformation of his character from this sort of slightly, yeah, introspective guy into this sort of yeah. extraordinary megalomaniac, <laughs> basically, <laughs> in a way. <coughs> yeah. Uh, in the end, uh, it struck me too watching uh, the, the silent film again over the weekend is the end bit that deals with the campaign in Italy very much, because that's the bit that's quite famous for being the, you know, the kind of polyvision sequence yeah. where they, because this was another innovation of his in this film, is that it sort of predated by some 20 years or more, uh, Cinerama and uh, Panavision and, and um, all the widescreen film processes yep. but what they actually did was they designed this and it was all done specifically for the film at Abel Gantz's sort of you know he woke up one day and he describes it in the documentary how he um, just sort of started thinking about it one day and kind of said oh I think we should try doing this but they basically t took three separate pieces of film together at the same time they designed a camera that had three lenses and so that they could basically be taking three f strips of film at the same time and then they projected it up on the up on the screen simultaneously so that you got one big panoramic yeah. image and you remember when we saw it down at the nft Incredible. that moment when the when the curtains opened up wider and then the the, the other two frames came up yeah it was it was quite this sort of like whoa and it turned you know. into a trickle as well isn't it There's, yeah 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 it's, uh, the music goes into the Marseillais and it's sort of yeah absolutely remarkable bit of uh, cinema really yeah it, it, and it struck me watching it at home because obviously it wasn't quite as impactful watching it on a television monitor where you know um, you know even if you have a really big Tele screen, it's not going to be comparable to seeing it projected up on a large screen in a yeah. in a hall. So, uh, but that sequence really doesn't show anything. Some of the earlier battle scenes very much show how the battle progressed, and they go into great detail about how he, you know, uh, thought of his ideas and how he yeah. marshaled people and said, "No, we got to do this, and then do that, and oh, this is happening, so we have to do this." But this, that scene at the end where he invades Italy is just basically the three screens. He's in the middle and they just kind of show his face sort of doing this and kind of looking around approvingly, you know. And then out on the side they just have marching soldiers or, you know, uh, you know people. Oh, yeah, yeah, but they don't actually go into any detail or show anything. And then that's kind of the last sort of 15, 20 minutes of the film is just this... And it is incredibly, um, with, along with Carl Davis's score, the, the, um, it, it has quite a, a, an emotional impact and as a spectacle. Yeah. But actually looking at it, when I was watching that bit, I kind of thought, well, they're actually not, nothing's actually happening. Uh, okay. It pure is spectacle. more, yeah, it is just literally just pure spectacle and just images yeah. and all playing off each other okay. and, and all the music swelling and stuff, and it's quite impactful, but right. but there's nothing actually happening <laughs> in the story. And then it just kind of ends and says, "And Napoleon, he was so great, and he and he, you know, and he won." And then, and then that's kind of the end of the film. Yeah. So so um, that was interesting, and I guess obviously the fact that there was more planned 
that they were going to do more to tell, carry on the story. Yeah, all his uh, battles. I mean, how many battles was he in? Lots. Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. Lots. And, um, yeah, and I, I guess the the thing with the Gantz is production is that it, it, it obviously was this big huge thing and he was because he was so uh, much like Napoleon very innovative and thinking on his feet and coming up with ideas they basically ran out of money and the film cost uh, kind of went over budget and they basically uh, when the film premiered in Paris it wasn't as well received as I think they were hoping so they ended up cutting it down uh, yeah. for a wider release and uh the film basically didn't didn't really recoup its costs or it didn't or or not enough so that they could warrant make carrying on and making yeah. any further films and then unfortunately over the years kind of the the film's uh, reputation so it didn't really uh, you know Gantz's career kind of fizzled out after that and he mm. never really got the the sort of the the attention that he deserved and the kind of credit that he deserved until much later in life, like um, kind of in the 60s. I, I guess the film was was reissued in the 50s, and then because of the efforts of Ken, uh, Kevin Brownlow, who I guess when he was a kid, the story was that he, when he was a kid, he was collecting nine and a half mil sort of home movie versions of things, and he happened to find a couple reels of Napoleon and then he just became obsessed with the film because yeah. they were so mesmerizing that he actually wanted to get more of it and see more of it and see the complete film so he ended up doing lots of research about it yep. and he ended up collecting more bits and pieces and then eventually he did this restoration and over the years the restoration has grown because initially it was maybe three three four hours and then he kept getting to add a bit more footage to yeah. it they found a bit more stuff so it then expanded into the length that it is now which is about five and a half between five and a half six hours and apparently uh, like we were talking about before we started recording is that um in france they are looking to restore the film again yep um yeah. at the cinematheque in france uh, and they want to restore it to its premiere version, which would have been the the cut that Gantz prepared for its premiere in Paris in 1927. Yeah. So that is even longer, and you know, um, and I don't know because you you were saying that they had planned to bring it out this year, but it doesn't. Yes, that's that's what uh, the Wikipedia page said. Uh, mm -hmm. Wikipedia article on the on the film. <clears throat> it said it was meant to come out, but there's been delays essentially because the mm -hmm. films, uh, the 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 film actual um, nitrate film is so sort of old and delicate that it's taking uh, a great deal mm -hmm. longer than they anticipated. But the mm -hmm. film is actually also I learnt uh, one of the Vatican's list of films. Do you know about this? No, I, I didn't. <laughs> so well, in 1995, the uh, the Vatican issued a list of films it's called some important films basically and there's 45 films some yeah that okay. a selection of important films <laughs> yeah, okay. that, they, that they recommend okay. um some of them are some religious films yeah um like uh the flowers of st francis and things mm -hmm. like this but then yeah. which i think we'll be talking about at a, a later date i think we will be and uh but others uh, just good films and they are yeah. actually they're all you know, great films. <laughs> yeah, and this is Pasolini's the Gospel of St. Yeah, Matthew's I think, on there I think well. that might be on there too, yeah. And there's a few others. Yeah, um, but they're not all religious, and uh, this is uh, this is one of the non-religious ones. <laughs> it's an interesting choice as well, because yeah. it's about a, you know, a, a, you know, a soldier and, and about, you know, I don't know, that, that, that is interesting that they would choose that film, but I guess it... Uh, aside from the fact that it is, you know, very interesting and entertaining piece of film to watch, it is obviously of great historical yeah. significance because yeah. of its innovation and and uh, and a, a lot of uh, things in terms of the French film industry and yeah. uh, it's it's obviously a very important historical film. It is, uh, but mm. I, one thing I would say, which I don't think we've perhaps not made clear. 
quite enough is that even though this film was made in 1927, it completely holds up today. Oh, yeah. And you don't have to be into sort of obscure, silent films to enjoy it. I think anybody... Absolutely not. I mean, it's the fast cutting makes Paul Greengrass seem quite sleepy. <laughs> yeah. It is. I mean, that's what strikes you about it when you watch it, because it's a very modern film stylistically. Yeah. All the grammar and stuff that's in there is thing like you made the the comment about MTV. Yeah. It's like it's very much like has that very modern rapid cutting. Yeah. You know, and, and combined with the music it's incredibly mm. effective and modern and you don't feel uh, you know, with any when you watch a silent film there is that initial few minutes of sort of acclimatizing yourself to getting used to it because it's a bit stylistically or it's a bit different. You're used to having color and sound yeah. and there's certain grammar and things in film that, that modern viewers kind of take for granted when they sit down to watch a show on Netflix or whatever. There's all these things that even though you're not conscious of it, these are all things that are ingrained that you're used to when you're watching a film or a TV program. But, so when you watch a silent film, there is a, a bit of an adjustment that you have to make. Yeah. But I think a lot of people, if they're intimidated by that, the reality is it's kind of only takes a minute to yeah, do that. Definitely. And then if, and then once you do that, in your you can then focus on just watching the film and experiencing it and getting into the story. Yeah. But the thing that's striking about Napoleon is just how modern it feels in terms of of that grammar of uh, of the editing and the yeah. and the movement <clears throat> and the style of it is very much feels like a modern film but the one thing i would say that where it is probably a little less modern is the representation of the man because it's very you know he is this sort of he's fairly unambiguously a, a good guy yeah whereas nowadays we're not uh, the sh um, sh heroes are generally uh, we, we are sort of a bit more sort of sceptical about the hero. Yeah. Well, yeah, there isn't necessarily a lot of psychological complexity to no. the to the representation of the characters. Yeah, Every, they're all sort of shown in a in a more uh, you know uh, idealized way or. Yeah you know, a symbolic way, because even some of the other peripheral characters, you know, some of the, the people who were involved in the revolution and the terror, you know, the, the, the time when they were basically chopping everybody's heads off. Yeah. And, and, you know, the development of the new government and all that, the, 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 the film, the film portrays them very much as sort of archetypal rather than sort of complex characters who have, you know, where you really dig in deep to their motivations and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. that that is, I guess, something that, that we can more talk about with Ridley Scott's film, where there, I think there is a bit more of psychological complexity that's demonstrated yes, certainly with, with, with the characters. Napoleon himself. Yeah, oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I mean, this is sort of the Joker too, wasn't it, in a sense? Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, very much, uh, Walk how do you say his name? Joaquin, Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin Phoenix, yeah, he's yeah. a brilliant actor. Yeah. But, I mean, he does kind of specialize in those, um, those kind of uh, characters and those kind of, you know, things but but before we start talking about the the, the current napoleon um i wanted to talk a bit about the carl davis uh, if we go back to abel gantz's napoleon yeah uh, about his his score for the film because it, it's very much an important part of of it i think yeah to to someone who's experiences it now because obviously when we saw it down at NFT, we saw it with Carl Davis conducting a live yeah, orchestra, there was. and it was yep. extraordinary, just an amazing day. Wow, uh, absolutely amazing. And the score, he very much uh, adapted sort of contemporaneous, uh, contemporaneous yeah. of Napoleon's time yeah. Yeah. Uh, music, so there's a lot of Beethoven. It's, it's more or less built around Beethoven, sort of the third, mainly the third symphony, but there's a bit of the seventh and the ninth in there. Yep. And there's a few other little bits of Beethoven, like some of his overtures and things that are peppered in there as well. But he doesn't just sort of, they're not just playing those pieces. He 
he's adapted the music to fit yep. with the 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 emotional elements of what you're seeing on screen and and it's it, it's like it's one of the best silent film scores i think going because mm. even though there's very familiar pieces of music in there he uses it in a in a way that emphasizes what you see on screen yeah and i know when you watch a lot of modern si sorry when you watch a lot of modern presentations of silent films like on blu-ray or when you go to screenings and they have you know there's a, a for a few years there was a thing going where they were getting a lot of sort of uh, popular pop musicians and yep. things like that to do live scores and they perform it live like it may have to a certain extent have started with the napoleon thing that idea of yep. having live musical accompaniment with these screenings but a lot of times those scores don't necessarily it it, it does come across like sometimes people are just kind of playing music along while the images are going on in the background. Mm. But Carl Davis very much composed a score that emphasizes like a modern film score yep. that emphasizes what's going on on screen and matches the emotional arc of what you're seeing and, and actually m matches and fits the images that you're seeing on screen. And so, and doubly fitting because uh, uh, Beethoven, especially at the beginning, was a great fan of Napoleon. He was indeed. The, the Eroica was uh, was originally um, dedicated to him. Yeah. But then when Napoleon, uh, you know, when he was getting a little bit more uh, sort of, uh, you know, full of himself and his, his success, he crowned himself Emperor of Europe or or was it just well, France? Just, oh, oh, just French. a French, yep. a France, and uh, and it was at that point that Beethoven was like, "All right, you crossed it out." Didn't yeah, you? yeah, because like, be yeah, Beethoven was a to... bit of a lefty, as we'd call them nowadays, and he obviously he was very much for the when the revolution, the idea of liberating Europe from the monarchies and the and you know and uh, and giving people freedom. Uh, but then when, when things didn't quite turn out that way, his, his opinion of, of Napoleon changed quite dramatically. Yeah. Yep. And, and as the story goes, he ripped the front page of the score and, or no, he didn't rip, he, 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 he just scribbled he out, scribbled the, out the, 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 the dedication to yep. Napoleon, but it still apparently survives that, that, that piece of, uh, paper, the sheet music still exists with those markings on yeah. it. So yeah. everybody knows uh, that he changed his mind. <laughs> so, uh, so very interesting, historical. Yeah. Um, was there anything else you wanted to say about Napoleon? No. The Abel <clears throat> Gantz's Napoleon. Well, yes, one, actually there was you know, one little thing that in America, if you watch it, you don't see the Carl Davis score, you see Carmen Coppola score. Who yes, is Francis, right. Francis is Francis Ford's Francis Dad. Ford Coppola's father, yeah, yeah. did because Francis Ford Coppola through Zo Zoe Trope Studios or his yeah. own production company, they he financed uh, a uh, restoration, a, 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 yeah, a reissue of Napoleon yeah. in the early eighties, yeah. and his father did the score for it. But yeah. I think it, it was based on Kevin Brownlow's restoration. Uh, okay, so he was involved in in that. And then the film sort of opened in Radio City Music Hall and then got a wider release in the cinemas. Right. And I remember that was the first time I saw it because oh, okay. it was on, they showed it on television uh, one evening. And, Does it have uh, and lots of dates over in it as well? Uh, I, to be honest, I don't really remember. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember anything about it because I would have been sort of, you know, 13, 14 years old. And, yeah. but I remember watching it when it was on, they showed it on television after it had been in the cinemas yeah. and, uh, uh, being a sort of a, a pro probably not a lot of 13, 14 year olds were that interested in watching that film. Uh, but I did, I was very interested and I checked it out and, and, um, remember being quite impressed by it right um but yeah now there, there was a little bit of a legal dispute because i guess francis mm. ford coppola kind of wanted to assert his rights over it and yep. make sure that his father's score became the de facto score yes. to the film when it was uh exhibited anywhere yeah. but obviously legally i mean they obviously came to some sort of arrangement because zoetrope studios is 
mentioned in the credits on the Blu-ray that, okay. that I have. So okay. they obviously came to some sort of negotiated settlement of right. that dispute. Yep. But the thing is about a film from 1927, I'm not sure what the legalities around asserting copyrights are no. in films be up to a certain point. Um, but I think you can assert copyright on a specific restoration okay. that you do, but you can't assert your rights over the actual ownership of the film. So right. someone else can go and do their own restoration right. of a film that's in the public domain, okay. and then they own the, the copyright to that restoration. Right. So you see, that's, I think, where the complexities of the situation come in. Right. So I'm not sure how much, uh, and again, I, I don't know really anything about it, I'm just speculating, yeah. but I think that um, Francis Ford Coppola might not necessarily have had much real legal basis to be able to you know, assert ownership over the film. Yep. So they had to come to some sort of negotiated settlement over it. Right. Um, but anyway, I, I strongly recommend that people, um, if you're interested in Napoleon, and obviously because of all the buzz and excitement over the new Ridley Scott film, yeah. that it's definitely worth going and checking out Abel Gantz's, uh, and, and I think it's fair to call it a masterpiece, because it is oh, quite yeah. an incredible viewing experience. And like I say, the advantage of having a video, uh, watching it at home, on 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 video and or on you know, I think it's available on the BFI's streaming service as well. I think one of the advantages of that is that you don't have to do that, like we did that day where it was a whole day no. of watching this whole big mammoth thing all in one go. And it was a nice day, and it was good. It was good. It was a great film and a great experience. But it was also nice to be able to break it up and yeah. watch it in smaller, more digestible chunks Definitely. so Definitely that you can sense. sort of enjoy it and spend some time taking stuff in. And and um, I think there's some value in that as well. So um, definitely go and check that out, folks. Uh, I'm not, we're not in any way paid or sponsored by BFI. Just say, put oh, saying yeah. that because I know I end up, I plug them quite a bit. <laughs> but, but you know, we're not... Um, we're not plugging it because uh, we're getting anything out of it no. except just to try and get you guys to go and check out really cool things. Yep. So the BFI has a three disc Blu-ray set comes in a lovely little box set and it's got a lovely book with it and it's got loads of supplemental features in it. Uh, like I said, there's a documentary and, and, and interviews and a thing about the restoration and uh, they have the, you know, the three panels from the polyvision ending, they present them separately as well so that you can see them big and bigger on your uh, screen. Okay. Oh, and then they also have a fourth, uh, because the film after the big premiere in Paris, yep. obviously it wasn't practical for all cinemas. They wouldn't have had the setup to be able to run three projectors simultaneously to get that effect. So they did prepare a single frame version of the ending okay. and that's also included on the on the disc as well right. and you actually have the option of watching the fourth section the fourth act of the film right either with the big trip tech at the end or you can choose to watch it with the uh, okay. the single frame version <clears throat> yeah so so you have options there about how you prefer to watch it as well that's good so it's a really really nice set it's still available and in print as far as i know so go out and get one because it's Definitely. it's worth having and it's yep. worth checking out yep um so jonathan i yes. think what we might do is take our Any customary pause? little break yep and then we're going to come good. back and we're going to talk about because uh we went to the cinema today and saw ridley scott's new we napoleon did. and we're going to sit down and uh, have a little chat about our first impressions of watching that film this afternoon so, folks, stay right there. Don't go away. Uh, listen carefully to the next message because there's uh, some very interesting stuff that you're going to want to know about our social media stuff. <laughs> okay, so we'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Film Swap podcast. 
If you like this podcast, please consider giving the show a rating or leaving a review. This helps other listeners find the show. You can follow The Film Swap on social media. We're on Twitter and TikTok at FilmSwap UK, on Instagram at FilmSwap Media, and on YouTube at FilmSwap underscore podcast, and at Facebook at FilmSwap The Podcast. To learn more, visit our website at filmswap.uk. General, we are discovered. Good. Wait! Nice! It's a trap! Retreat! And we're back. Jonathan. We uh, yes. just came back today uh, from the cinema. Did. In Epsom, we saw the uh, the very first screening there in Epsom, anyway, of uh, Napoleon, Ridley Scott's Napoleon. Yeah. We've talked about Abel Gantz's Napoleon, so now it might be time to talk about the big picture, the big new picture. Yeah. This is something a bit different for us, because we, obviously, we normally talk about films that are a bit older, that are a bit older like uh, previously released things, but this, we thought we'd do something a bit different today and talk about a brand new blockbuster film on opening day, seeing mm. it on opening day, and then uh, having a talk about it. Um, so, what were your first impressions of Ridley Scott's Napoleon? Well, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't what I was expecting. Mm. Because I'd uh, read or listened to this book earlier in the year about uh, Napoleon, and I was expecting, I guess, a sort of, you know recounting of the, the classic story of Napoleon, uh, we, we, well, the one that that book told. Mm. But we got a sort of slightly different tale, mm. a story of Joachim Phoenix as Napoleon, which is a sort of different type of Napoleon, basically. Yes. What do you think? Well, I, I agree. I think um, at, after having seen uh, Abel Gantz's Napoleon uh, over the weekend and very much the interpretation of Napoleon was as very much a heroic figure in yeah. that film, um, you know, a French national hero, one of the, the you know, this uh, genius tactician and charismatic leader of men, yeah. and, uh, you know, someone who was a champion of the revolution, yeah. and uh, he's someone who was uh, working towards trying to liberate Europe from the monarchies and and things like that. So that was kind of Abel Gantz's interpretation, uh, uh, very much a French one. Yeah. But uh, Ridley Scott's was a little bit different because it showed Napoleon as a bit more of a complex character, yep. uh, someone who was a little bit uh, of a chancer, someone who was a bit of a um, uh, conflicted person uh, and uh, very much driven by his ego and uh, uh, and a bit uh, moody and uh, mm. um, surly and um, childish in some ways. You as definitely well. be childish in this film. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so it was a very much a different interpretation, more complex in many ways. Yeah, uh, uh, and he also wasn't, uh, you know, the. You know, he's obviously much more human, presented as a much more human figure, but also um, flawed and um, yeah. uh, a bit dangerous and a bit, um, uh, you know, un uncaring in some ways, too, I guess. Certainly. Yeah. Is that a fair thing to say? Um, and that was what I guess... I, I wasn't expecting as well the kind of the humor and things, which was something that I, that really struck me about the film <clears> is that <throat> it had a real strain of sort of black humor running through it. Yeah. And, and it kind of showed a bit more of the absurdity of Napoleon's personality and of some of the events and the, and the, you know, the machinations of politics and, and the things that drove these very violent, confrontations yep. uh, and these invasions and, and battles, great battles and things, sort of the machinations behind it. Yep. Um, so in that sense, it's a very, very, a, a, a very different film from Abel Gantz's film. 
It is indeed. It mm. is indeed. Yeah, it's much more. I guess it's much more contemporary. You know, in the point of view of Napoleon, in mm. some ways, like the actual sort of filming is more sort of uh, conservative or old-fashioned. Mm. But uh, because you know, there's sort of lots of sort of interior shots of beautiful 18th-century rooms with lit by candles, a bit like uh, with Stanley Kubrick's um, film. What's he call it? Ba and Barry Lyndon. Barry Lyndon. Thank you very much. Um, and which is sort of beautiful, but they're like basically taking the influence there is sort of painting, yeah. and um, which he used in the Duelists, his earlier sort of Napoleonic era film. Yes, we talk that that's something interesting that we it's worth mentioning is that in an earlier episode, one of our earliest episodes, uh, I think uh, called Cinematic Swordplay, yeah. we talked about Ridley Scott's very first feature film called The Duelist, yep. and that was set during the Napoleonic Wars, yeah. and it was uh, where the two characters were soldiers in Napoleon's army, yep. and it uh, went over their uh, trials and tribulations and their adventures, yep. and uh, so that's quite an interesting counterpoint as well mm. to this film, which is, uh, you know, Ridley Scott, again, many decades later, revisiting the Napoleonic yeah. Wars, but telling the story about Napoleon, yeah, from from uh, top, from the, the top bottom. down, yes, yeah, yeah, at the top rather than the bottom. Well, he likes revisiting things, doesn't he? He does seem to, yes. New Napoleon uh, Gladiator Two is coming out soon. He's done a s yeah. I don't really know how that's going to work. Yeah, um, and interesting too. There's another little interesting uh, uh, similarity in that we talked about Abel Gantz and about the fact that he was planning on a big mammoth five-part series yeah. about Napoleon that would have told his whole life story and would have ran to like hours and hours and hours. But actually Ridley Scott made a, a Robin Hood film with Russell Crowe, didn't he? Uh, and yes. originally the plan there was it was going to be something like a five-film cycle that was, it. that was supposed to trace Robin Hood's whole story arc through oh, really? this series of films, but because the Robin Hood film, uh, I guess, d uh, didn't meet uh, right. the expectations of whoever's expectations it was supposed to meet, I guess, right. financially or critically or whatever it was, um, um, they didn't follow through and do that. Okay. So there's a k kind of a, a bit of a parallel with Abel Gantz there in terms of uh, Ridley funny. Scott. Um, not getting to see a, a project through the way he originally envisioned. Right. So well, I guess that's good because you've got this mm -hmm. film rather than the fourth or the fifth or the sixth uh, Robin Hood film, yes. which he'd still be he'd spent the rest he'd of his career still making be Robin doing. Hood films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, a bit strange, but uh, yeah, I guess that that is a similarity. And yeah, I guess the th thing about uh, Joaquin Phoenix is he's quite a sort of tortured character, isn't he? This, he is. Uh, he seems to specialise in these kind of characters, doesn't he? In this kind of... Um, intense. Yeah, very intense, brooding, guys, brooding, and, you know, in, internalised, uh, struggling with some sort of internal demon. Joaquin Phoenix performance in this. Am I saying that right? Wa Joaquin. Joaquin, I think. Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, his, uh, like, I almost saw this film as, as sort of the Joker only dressed as Napoleon, because the I kind of felt like the characters were very, very similar, right. like in terms of just the way that they behaved and their mannerisms and, their, okay. and the sort of their, you know, the, the little bits where he'd giggle uh, when somebody said something that was uh, sort okay. of upsetting to him or something, he'd kind of do this. The Joker with know? a bike on hat. Basically. Yeah, yeah, basically. So it was a little bit, I kind of saw some... Uh, very similarity stylistically to the way the, the characters were presented. Right. But obviously, you know, the, in the Joker, he, he goes proper, you know, loop, goes proper loopy, where in this yeah. one, it's more of a sim uh, kind of a simmering undercurrent of loopiness all the way through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, cause I, uh, I'm not sure how sort of he, tortured he was, Napoleon. I, he wasn't, he was more of a man of action than somebody who was sort of... Yeah you know, sort of consider, you know, getting lost in sort of self-recrimination. But... Uh, Do you think that's fair to say? Because the kind of person, uh, like uh, uh, someone who leads men, yeah, 
into like things like these just horrendous, yeah. you know, violent confrontations where thousands of people. I mean, I've never understood that about the about how how uh, people can be talked into it. Like you can get thousands and hundreds or thousands of men all to gather together in a field somewhere and start hacking each other to bits with yeah. swords or with cannon shot or things like that. And I never, I can't understand why people would go, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Yeah, why not? <laughs> you know, dress up in an outfit and go and march for days and days and on little That's why food. you're not an emperor. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I'm not a soldier. But uh, but the thing is, like, I don't understand how people could be talked into doing that. You would yeah. think, like, a normal reaction to that would be in the first place would be to go, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Or when you get there to kind of go, all right, I'm going. I'll see you later. I'm not yeah. sticking around for this. Right. But. What is it about these people that they're able to talk other people into going along with these adventures? Yeah, going along with these sort of things, these ordeals. Well, this is one of the things. You know, you, it's not entirely clear in this. You, well, basically, it doesn't convey his uh, charisma quite as much as you'd expect. There are moments yeah. where his uh, when he's in Russia, he's giving out bread to the soldiers. Yeah. And when he comes back uh, before Waterloo, the soldiers go, Vive l'Empereur, you know, when they're meant to be sort yeah. of shooting and getting rid of him. And then later on, uh, there's this bit where he's just about to go into exile right at the end of the film. Mm. And he's on the British battleship HMS Bellerophon. Mm. And there's the uh, midshipmen. And the midshipmen are sort of like 12, 13, 14 year olds, some junior officers who basically just left home and they're very, very young, mm. perhaps even some younger than 10. And they're all standing there, sort of watching him uh, and listening to him sort of pontificate mm. on things. Mm. And um, in, in the book uh, Napoleon the Great, he uh, says, uh, that that's what happened. He was he sort of he, he sort of charmed them and enchanted these uh, young boys, mm. um, and uh, so there is a a bit of it. But there's quite a lot where you think this guy is just a sort of yeah, he, he just. A, a... Well, it's an interesting thing too because when you say those scenes when he ride, kind of rides in front of the army on his horse, and all the men go, hey, woo, Napoleon, woo, yeah, like that. But the thing is, they are not people who would have had any kind of access to him whatsoever. They no. wouldn't have been able to talk to him or meet him or have anything to do with him. And a lot of that is just sort of like, you know, kind of just going along with the crowd, isn't it, to a certain extent? Well, because they yeah. would have no personal connection with the man. But he did give out in 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 the sort of, you know, in real life, he did give out sort of medals and sort of he was, he took a great interest in his troops. That was mm. one of his sort did of he? his, that's one of his things made, because at the beginning, because uh, they started off just after the revolution and the sort of, they barely even had boots and the sort of patches in their clothes and they hardly, they're all half starved mm. and he made sure they all ate properly, they had proper uniforms and then he'd sort of stop and sort of take an interest in, in each sort of, so, so when he was, so one of the key things was his ability to foster esprit de corps uh, and um, so I guess, I mean there isn't time to go into that, that's not the key thing. I guess one of the key things in the film is his relationship, the big thing is his relationship with Josephine, isn't it? It is. But to, just to go back on that yeah. point a minute, the, like for a minute, though, because that is maybe something that the film doesn't convey necessarily very well. No. About the fact that why why was he a great leader of men? Where was that charisma that really engaged people and got them on board and and to follow him and to have that thing? It, mm. it, it, like maybe in in literature and things you can get that sense and you have that but but in the film there was only little snippets of it like, like you yeah. said the scene where he handed out the bread yeah uh but even that like came across because he sort of was half eaten it himself wasn't he and just the odd guy would come by and he'd rip off a piece and go here here you go may have some mm. you know have some and obviously you know every some of them were getting left out yeah you know he was just sort of randomly handing it out to whoever yeah so you, you so the film doesn't really necessarily successfully convey that what it was about him that made him a great leader yeah. of men. Yeah. You know what was it about him that made people want to follow him and 
and kind of go, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's yep. do that. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, did it did, for you? I don't know. Well, no, I didn't. I, I did slightly feel like we're, uh, I wasn't entirely. I, by the end, I was. I, I was sort of. We all. It's not. It's not a spoiler. He dies <laughs> two hundred years ago. He, yeah. he loses the Battle of Waterloo. He ends up on uh, you know uh, Saint Helena, this island in the middle of nowhere, miles, thousands of miles from anywhere. Yeah. And he did sort of feel. If not sorry for him, a bit like, yeah, a little bit sorry for him because he was sort of this guy who tried to achieve sort of great things and was with somewhat noble ideals. Obviously, they were very much tainted by his personal sort of ambition. Yeah. But uh, it was, he was trying to sort of further the ideals of the French Revolution and everything. Um, but yeah, I did. Yeah, I did slightly wonder because he was a bit of a moody teenager quite a lot. <laughs> so wh- why was, exactly? Yeah, he didn't necessarily always come across as a particularly likable person in the no. film. I didn't think. No. Um, and you are right, like because that's what kind of people are like. Because you can even see that nowadays that people, to a certain extent, look up to people just based on success, don't they? If yeah. someone, for whatever reason, has great success whether it be you know commercial or or whatever otherwise then people tend to gravitate around them and somehow say oh well this is somebody who's worth listening to and this is somebody who's worth following because they've been successful then as soon as things don't go successfully i mean last week uh was it that was it last week yeah we were talking about peter bogdanovich oh uh, yeah and there's a great example of someone who had a string of successes yeah and so he was he was like suddenly this big important figure in the film industry yeah people were like saying okay what do you want to do next here's some money let's go make some films come on mm. peter what do you want to do come on go 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 and everyone wanted to work with him and he was like yeah 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 but yep. then as soon as he made a couple of films that things didn't go to plan, didn't go to, exp- to as expected and weren't successful necessarily, yep. then all of a sudden he was like he yesterday's abandoned. news and yeah, yep. nobody wanted to work with him and he, he had trouble financing his films and it was mm. it was a different story. And you can see that in Napoleon. It's like as long as he was winning wars and he was accomplishing things, Everyone was like, "Yay, Napoleon!" Woo-hoo. You know, <laughs> well, but then as soon as something went wrong, then it was sort of like, "Right, mate, you're you go go and get on your rock in the middle of the ocean there and stay out of the way." Well, it was. I'd say that you know, because he was sent to Elba after the sort of uh, the invasion of Russia, mm. and uh, but then he decided. I can't abide being stuck on this rock, this uh, rock in the Mediterranean. Um, Though to be fair, it looked pretty nice to me. I was it did sort look, of like thinking, you know, May, I don't know, you got a pretty good thing did, going there. It did, did look you nice. had a very nice uh, pension yep, and a very did. beautiful island with people waiting on him and stuff, and you kind of think, mate. Yeah, maybe he might be better off just sitting tight. But the, that was his. <laughs> that was his thing. He was very ambitious, wasn't he? And yeah. so he, when he came uh, back, you know, he was he was sort of the the ultimate loser, mm. and or the or penultimate loser. And but then still, the, the troops rallied to his cause. They did, so, yeah. So despite, and all he had to do was kind of say. I've I've missed you guys. Yeah. And then they were like, yeah, all right then. (laughs) Peter Bogdanovich never got that, did he? (laughs) No, he certainly did not. He did not. (laughs) Uh, Well, I mean, maybe he did. Maybe he did. Um, Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the other thing, you know, as I I sort of mentioned a bit earlier, is that the the big thing for, for this is Napoleon... And Josephine. So it's it is Napoleon. It's called Napoleon, but it's mm. a lot of it is all about Josephine, isn't it? It did, yeah. It did focus very much on that relationship, and I think she was an interesting character in the way because in Abel Gantz's film, she's Josephine is very much portrayed in a very kind of two dimensional manner. She's yep. she's this beautiful woman, and he's besotted with her, and he goes all all simpery and and like you know yep. sort of um like a like a lap dog when she's around 
And uh, that's kind of the way she is in that film. She's just like this vision of loveliness who, right. who he is besotted with. And but yeah. they don't really go into, despite the the length of time that they spend on that relationship. Yeah, it's not really particularly complex or gone into and out with a lot of psychological depth or right. resonance there. Yep. But in this film, she's very much a, a, a three dimensional character. She's somebody who. You, you don't really get a lot of information about her past. No. They kind of just hint at it. But they also understand that she's, you know, you, or sorry, you come to understand when you're watching the film that that she's got a bit of a history. Yep. She's she's uh, um, been previously married and she's had other lovers. And yep. obviously in those days that was, was you know, the kind of thing that got uh, people... Um, you know, all tittle tattly and stuff, and, yeah. and it didn't look good. Uh, but he he was besotted with her. But she clearly the feelings weren't requited in the same way. Yeah. She, she clearly didn't have the same sort of feelings for him. Yeah, I think that's accurate from yeah. from what, my understanding of it that she wasn't so into him as he was into her, and, that, and that's the sort of one of the sort of charming things about him because in terms of sort of politics you know he was mm. this sort of the biggest cheese in Europe mm. but at home his you know his wife sort of didn't love him or barely loved him or mm. was quite happy to be having lots of other relationships whilst he and whilst he was sort of you know slightly going mad with uh, jealousy yeah and I did like that bit I thought because it was quite true to you know what um you know, this idea of a man, if he's found out his wife has been unfaithful to him, and they had that little extended thing where they were sitting around sort of talking it through, mm. and the recriminations and the anger, and then the, you know, the, the sort of, you know, different things that people would go through in a conversation like that. Yeah. You know, and she obviously, for whatever reason, whether because she obviously... As as the story progresses, she seemed to develop more feelings for him. Yes, but to a, she was obviously for whatever reason at that stage she was upset at the idea of the of the marriage ending. Yep, and so the uh, the fact that she was trying to convince him not to kick her out or divorce her or whatever at that stage, and you can see that that just like any couple would have if one of the others discovered a, an infidelity and they were sitting around having a having that discussion with the anger and the yeah. and then the trying to make up and the and you know the the highs and lows of that conversation yeah. and it's depicted in the film quite well mm. that they have that sort of you know yeah. over several hours having that conversation and how it progresses so yeah. that was quite an interesting sequence i thought yeah yeah that's mm. true that's something we definitely wouldn't get in april Kent's, i'm sure <laughs> yeah yeah they just definitely they did they kind of gloss over the her her previous relationships and, yeah and they definitely don't go into any detail about her having any other lovers after she's married to him right uh, yeah. but then again the the film only covers a certain part of his life yeah, and it only covers up to him getting married. Yeah. So in subsequent films, had right. Gantz been able to complete the project as intended, perhaps those elements would have come into the story. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. I'm sure they would have because they're yeah. good, good dramatic fodder for mm. uh, for telling a story, aren't they? So definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah I guess the the thing that, that I was a bit surprised by, I thought it would be. I guess, like an, an old-fashioned sort of historical epic like this, would have been a lot more about his sort of achievements on the battlefield and stuff mm. like that. And I think there was four battles, and sort of at least one of them was very cursory. There was yeah. Toulon right at the beginning, yeah. Austerlitz his great victory, Borodino his great sort of was well, one of his defeats, mm. and then um, Battle of Waterloo at the end. Mm. But as you said, the Battle of Waterloo is a, a lot shorter than um, what, what's the yeah, Waterloo, <laughs> the film yeah. Waterloo. Yeah, there was there there was a previous film in the seventies with Rod Steiger and Christopher Plummer who played yeah. Wellington, and it's a great film. I know it's a film that um, wasn't particularly well received at the time, 
and it has a bit of a sort of a mixed um, reputation even now, I think. But I personally think it's a really good film yep. because it does, I mean, it show, it has a little bit of a lead up to the battle, but it is quite literally the whole film is this big epic reenactment of the Battle of Waterloo right. in great detail. And without, again, much like Abel Gantz, there wasn't that, uh, you know, they didn't have CGI back then. No. There was no computer cartoons. They couldn't use AI to recreate uh, all the soldiers in the background and stuff. They literally got thousands of extras and did it right on the spot where the actual battle took place. Yeah. And they reenacted the whole thing and filmed it in this big epic two-hour film and it i think it's amazing visually stunning and it's a right. great spectacle and it's very interesting because it goes into the detail of how the battle developed and the decision making that yep. went on behind the scenes for either in on napoleon's side or wellington's side yep. it showed them saying okay this is happening so that now i'm going to make this decision and we're going to do this yeah and it sort of showed the whole battle how it how it how it developed and, mm. and, and ended up. So I think that's a great film and, uh, and it's definitely worth going to check out folks if you get a chance. Um, but, uh, this film, the battle of Waterloo, there isn't a huge amount of build up to it in the film is no. there? Uh, because like you say, it's concentrating more on his, uh, divorce with Josephine and, and all the sort of ramifications of all that. And then kind of Waterloo happens and it's going, I mean, the whole film's like that. Cause I found it, oh, it was very yeah. much like boom, boom, boom. And then this happened and then this happened and then this happened and this happened. Yeah. And it just sort of goes by all really, really quickly, yeah. uh, very, very rapid fire and nothing, they don't go into a lot of depth and detail into no. anything. Well, he did do a, an enormous amount in that, mm. in a short, sort of fairly short amount of time. Yeah, it's a big story to tell, isn't it's a big it? Story. Napoleon is like a huge, huge, monumental figure in history, and all yeah. the stories and all the, the the political wrangling and the revolution and the, all that stuff. It's a huge story. Completely. So getting it into a two and a half hour film, yeah. especially one that's more character driven or more focused on the individual characters yeah it's very difficult to cram all that information into a story and make it a compelling narrative yeah you know and i think obviously ridley scott was more trying to make it an entertaining yeah quick rapid fire film well i think that's why you know in a, in a sense the duelists his first film or one of the films we talked about earlier Mm. is sort of is a nice way of working around dealing with the Napoleonic Wars rather than sort of d talking about so much sort of politics and everything you just yeah. focus on two people sort of near the bottom uh, yeah. who sort of have to deal with sort of everyday realities of it yeah uh, which is a sort of yeah clever uh, approach yeah a absolutely and it kind of shows like how all these things impact those individuals and yeah. how, how just picking out two two i say random but you know just two minor people in this big huge piece of history that's going yeah. on and focusing on them and how how it affects them and 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 how they deal with the things that are going on around them is a kind of almost a more interesting way of telling the story mm. than it is on going broad and telling the the, the kind of the bigger yeah. piece, isn't it? Yeah. So galloping through it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean that that's the thing. I mean, it, if nothing else, this Napoleon just makes me think. Um, I want to know more. I want to more understand more about well, what happened there. Yeah. Why did these guys do this? And what, how did that end up yeah. happening? And what effect did that have? So, yeah. yeah, it kind of makes me think, oh, I'd like to go and read that book that you're talking about. Yeah. Or, you know, to kind of get a bit more in depth. Yeah. Although I must admit, I'm a bit Napoleoned out <laughs> this week after having watched <laughs> two mammoth epics about <laughs> Napoleon and also reading up all kinds of stuff about Napoleon. Yeah. So I think probably I'm going to park Napoleon for a little while after we're done this podcast. But at the same time, it, it, he is such an interesting figure, person. 
yeah. and all the history around it yeah. is uh, so monumental. Uh, it's such a monumental part of European history and yeah. stuff. So it's obvious that he, he's just the kind of person that uh, there'll be more films about him in the future, I'm sure, and more stories and more books because he's just the kind of thing that people want to dig into. But yeah. As a matter of fact, didn't Stanley Kubrick was going to make a Napoleon film, wasn't he? He was, yeah. Uh, but for whatever reason, that never came off. And yeah. it was interesting talking about Abel against Napoleon because I'd read, uh, I don't know if it's on the Wikipedia page or something, but they, yeah. they had said that Stanley Kubrick didn't like Abel Gantz as yes, Napoleon. Yes, I knew that, yeah. He, although he recognized the the innovative qualities in terms of yeah. the filmmaking and the technical innovation that went into making the film and the, yeah. and the style of it and everything. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, he he pointed out about the, 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 the more crude, as he put it, yeah. uh, or no, he used the word clumsy, he said that the storytelling was clumsy. Yeah, and there, and I can see what what he's saying because yeah. obviously the film, like we talked about, is very much it was a French film made by a French filmmaker about a great historical national French hero. figure. Who's yeah, a national hero yeah. to some anyway. And so this is this is the film takes that position that he's this great man, and yeah. but all the characters are presented as more you know, are, are archetypal or, or sort of more two dimensional mm. yep. sort of, uh, you know, representations of something yep. rather than you, know, you don't really get into the, you know, the deep psychological analysis of these characters and yep. their motivations yep. and their, you know, that that's something that Abel Gantz, uh, wasn't able to convey. And I mean, that's partly just about, you know, in silent films, that's harder to do, isn't it? It is. You have to do it in the more, you know, you have to convey that. You have to express things more in the photography and in the, yep. you know, maybe because even the, title cards. you know, the title cards can only convey so much because yep. you can't have too much information in those or, or it just ends up bogging down the pacing if you have to sit there reading loads and loads of text. Yep. So uh, silent films would just work on a much more, so subliminal level, level yeah. don't they yeah. in terms of how they express things yeah. and tell the story yeah. whereas in some something like Ridley Scott's film you can get more into the dialogue yeah. and you can approach characters in a different way and develop them yeah. and you know sort of touch on some of the details that you wouldn't necessarily be able to convey yeah. in, in another way so. yeah yeah that's true it is uh and 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 this one, um, it does sort of go into the psychology of uh, this this guy. I guess he's sort of yeah. an insecure Napoleon. Really. He seemed very insecure to me. <laughs> he came across that way very much so uh, as as someone who wasn't quite, you know, obviously the historical impression that people have of Napoleon is this great genius military tactician yeah. strategist who. Who, ambitious and he was very ambitious and and very self-assured uh, self-assured and confident and uh, had great abilities above and beyond that of just normal guys well i think that's undoubtedly <laughs> true <laughs> well, clearly he did he did i he mean he wrote books he wrote novels and history yeah. books and you know he was sort of he did all his these administrative reforms i mean this film didn't go into the administrative reform side of his no. uh, sort of uh, you know uh, reign or whatever it was um but yeah he, i mean he, it's yeah one of the other things i was going to mention is the performance of, by uh, rupert everett who yes, crops oh, up at the end absolutely brilliant uh, <laughs> as wellington Absolutely yeah. brilliant. He because he, he he brings he brought just the right touch of uh, uh, of comedy to it, but also he gave him the gravitas and the yes. you know and um, and and what struck me was that like at, at least this was my interpretation of how how he came across as someone who he's going into battle with Napoleon, yeah, and he was kind of pooing his pants a little bit, wasn't he? He was a <laughs> yeah. little bit scared. He was a little bit like. Yeah, this we know this guy is 
really damn good. Yeah, and, even though he's and outnumbered. I, yeah, and he knew he kind of, yeah, exactly, because even though they had the numbers on their side and they had all this stuff planned, he sort of, you could see in the back of his head, he's going, yeah, this is Napoleon, and he's managed to pull a few rabbits out of his hat in his day, hasn't he? Exactly. So, you know, I need to really be on my toes here. Yeah. You know, because I'm, you know, this, you know, he he was he didn't come across as, like, I'm going to win this. No, it I think was, that's probably more, true. He, he, yeah. And I, I think when in, in the um, in Napoleon the Great book, it, it says that mm. when Napoleon died, um, uh, the Duke of Wellington said, well, that, that means I'm finally the best uh, general in Europe. <laughs> so he, he sort of acknowledged that Napoleon was uh, the best. <laughs> Not yeah. just better than him, but the best uh, of all. Uh, yeah, which I, I mean, I mean, maybe that's what he wanted. Maybe that's, is that, you know? Well, yeah, but I mean, it, it's, <laughs> that's, that's what makes him, one of the things that makes him such a compelling character, isn't it? Is mm. this character that just sort of basically became, for a, almost the U ruler of Europe for mm. sort of a few years yeah. before he sort of blew it all. Um, yeah. Er basically, everybody was trying to take him down, and he was like this sort of extraordinary character with all these sort of dogs attached to, <laughs> to his clothing, and he's sort of <laughs> wrestling, yeah. when they were sort of dropping off and jumping back on again, and he was... Yeah, yeah, there was always a constant sort of, yeah, the the egotism and the politics of everything, you know, and he managed to kind of charge through that and carve his own sort of, uh, you know... Path. Yeah, and it's uh, it's quite an extraordinary story, it really is. Yeah. And uh, so we know that uh, um, <clears throat> Apple TV or Apple Plus, or whatever they call it, Apple TV Plus, they um, f part financed this film. They did. And we do know that, um, uh, which seems an, an odd way f to me to like try and convince people to come to the cinema to watch a film when you kind of tell them up front that there's going to be a longer, more extended version of this yeah. shown on TV in a few months. But please come to the cinema and watch this anyway. <laughs> yeah, you know, even though it's like a truncated version, uh, and that um, there's uh, you're not actually seeing the whole complete picture. Um, but having said that, obviously seeing something in the cinema is a different experience yes. to seeing it on telly, yeah. and uh, also, you know, there's something to, to say sometimes, like you were saying about trying to tell a story in a more concise way without yeah. all the um you know with all the fat and trimmings <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. we've talked about it before but the fact is like and people are always saying to me you know uh oh dave have you seen this show it's really good you know this new you know series oh uh, yeah whether they be on netflix or amazon or whatever all these shows that come out yeah. the thing is and we've talked about this before the fact that i don't really like watching TV series. I right. tend to prefer watching films. Yep. Uh, I, I mean, I do, I'm not saying I don't watch them. I do watch the occasional one if I, it seems compelling enough that I want to check it out. Yep. But one of the things I don't like about TV series is the, is that is the fact that there's a lot of a, a lot Trains. of a lot of um, sort of dragging Little things meat. out. And repeating things and a lot of sort of unnecessary exposition and right. subplots and little sort of bits and pieces that go yeah. with shows that sort of just feel like they drag it out. Right. Whereas if they just made it into a more concise film and just told told the story and sort of got rid of some of the fluff yeah. that, you know... And it always seems to be like specific episodes as well. Like you, you'll have it like if it's an eight episode series you know the first couple will be really really engaging and good and you'll be getting into the characters and then you'll start getting into these yeah where some of the episodes just feel like they were just fluff yeah that where they were just sort of padding it out well this and one dragging things out this episode this uh sort of two and a half hour version of napoleon's the one for you then that long one well, maybe, but I mean, well, obviously, because I enjoyed this and was intrigued enough by it that I am interested in seeing a more extended version yeah. to see 
what what else like yeah. what, like where it is although from my understanding just from what little i've read about it is that it is more focused on the relationship between him and josephine yeah that's so, what i've read as well but i yeah. thought this is quite a lot about napoleon yeah. and josephine anyway it seemed to focus quite a bit on them anyway yeah so and to me where the film kind of sped through things was on some of those quite major battles yeah. and those major historical sort of uh, moments that didn't have to do with them too yeah. and you know whether they were you know getting it on or whether they you yeah. know were going to have a baby or whatever yeah you know they kind of glossed over some of that other stuff mm. and spent a lot of time on them so if the, the series or the, i call it a series but sorry if the if the more extended version that they show on Apple TV yep. even expands even more on them, but not on the other stuff, then I would think, oh, well, I'm I'm not too sure about that. Actually, maybe yeah. we were better off just seeing the yeah seeing the cinema version. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot that was sort of missed out of this one. Um, so well, I don't think it was missed out on so much as it was just kind of gone, but, got over, yeah. just because it's sort of on and on, and then off you go. Yeah. So, so like, and then this happened. Oh, and then this happened, and then this happened, and yeah. then this happened. It yeah. kind of felt a bit like that. It was a bit. To me. And then, then we'd have these bits where it would stop while those two talked about their relationship. <laughs> had, a, had a little bit of a sort of a, you know, that. And then it'd be like, and then this happened, and then this happened. Yeah. And then it was Waterloo. And then it's over. Yeah. It's sort of, sort of like it was kind of felt a bit like that. To well, me. Was it was a bit like that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's true. Uh, but it's still enjoyable. Well, that was the thing. I think just in the interest of time, Jonathan, I'm just wondering if um, is there any kind of last thoughts? Like if you were saying, because this is a brand new film. Yep. Uh, uh, all being well, I'm going to have this episode out within the next day or two, so yep. that it'll be nice and current. Yep. This is a brand new film that's just come out this weekend. And uh, so what would you say to someone who's thinking about watching it or someone who's kind of on the fence and going, oh, I don't know. Mm, well, I don't know. I'd say, what would you say to them? I'd say go and see it. It's got okay. two, at least two fantastic performances from Joaquin Phoenix and uh, Vanessa Kirby. Mm -hmm. The story of... And Mo Rupert Everett. And Rupert Everett. I mean, there's got loads of great sort of character actors. Great character, well. yeah. Loads of familiar there's, faces that you've like you've seen in loads, loads of, of films loads and TV shows. Looks beautiful. All these yeah. sort of interior shots. Amazing CGI in the battles as yeah. well. Yeah. And um, uh, the, but it, it, I guess it's a slightly unusual telling of Napoleon's story, or perhaps not what I expected exactly. But it's. Mm. Definitely worth it. And I'm looking forward to seeing the longer version on Apple TV as well. Uh, and maybe if he puts out an even longer one, I'd probably watch that too. <laughs> <laughs> but not this week. Not, not like I need a few months <laughs> off from Napoleon now. I'm, I'm in a Napoleon yeah. year. <laughs> Let's put it like this. I already read you, the book read or the listened book to the book earlier yeah. in the year. Yeah. I'm, I'm all about Napoleon. Two, 2023 for me is uh, the year of... The year of Napoleon. Okay. <laughs> well, then, and, yeah. And, um, okay, well, I'm going to say the same thing. I think it's definitely worth going to see. It's a yeah. good, it's a good uh, entertaining film. Um, you know, maybe not perfect, and maybe there are so, some things like we've talked about you know, but I I think it's worth going to see. Certainly in the cinema where you get the spectacle and the two loud, you know, cannonballs that yeah. you know I think is probably given me shot. permanent hearing damage. Yeah, and uh, um, there is that. Uh, but I think it's worth going to see. Yeah, uh, and it's Ridley Scott, isn't it? I mean, he's no slouch, is he? No. He's he not someone. You, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we picked this film to do this kind of special episode where we actually went to the cinema and saw a film because Ridley Scott, you kind of, he's one of those filmmakers that you kind of know, even when he's not at his absolute best, he makes a good film. He yeah. knows how to make a good film. It definitely isn't. He one of knows his what worst. he's doing. Yeah. Doesn't he? Yeah. This is up with, uh, it's not, maybe it's not up with the top Frank, but it's definitely da not down with his uh, sort of, yeah. um, you know, stinkers. Stinkers. And uh, the other thing is that's quite interesting is the uh, comedy or the humour in it, the humour rather than comedy, mm. uh, which is sort of maybe a bit unexpected and yeah, quite got, got a few laughs from me as well. 
Well, yeah, certainly watching Abel Gantz as Napoleon. No loss. There's not, I mean, <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe there is some bits in there that are a bit sort of amusing or, or but at the same time, yeah, you don't, Napoleon himself very much comes across as this really stoic sort of, you know, figure. Yeah. Whereas in this Napoleon, he's, he's more, he has his moments where, you know, you have a laugh at either stuff he says or just the circumstances and that. Yeah. Like I say, I, at the beginning, I think the, the film that plays a little bit almost like a black comedy, doesn't it? In yeah. a sense, it has a little bit of a, uh, of a uh, sense of humor running through it. Definitely. And a bit of, sorry, what, what's the satire? term? Satire. Is, is sardonic. Yeah. Is that yeah, the word? Yeah. yeah, kind of a bit like that. And uh, I think I don't, like, uh, it's not... 100% clear what Ridley Scott's real, what he was really getting at with this film in terms of what he was trying to say about Napoleon. No. But obviously, and without, because I don't want to spoil the ending for people who haven't seen it, but there is a, you know, at the end, very, very um, often in films nowadays, they're about real events. They always have a little thing that comes up at the end yeah. with some sort of uh, factual you know placards that come up at the end and the, and it sort of makes what i think is sort of making a commentary about about the uh the human cost yeah of of That's all the true. all this the, the stuff that went on yeah. That are covered the events that are covered in this film, yep. which uh, you know maybe that's the point that he was trying to make about like all this, all the ambition and the the politics and the machination. You know there there's a human cost to all that. Yeah, and and um, so I guess that uh, hopefully he'll expand a bit on that in the longer extended version. Yeah, because that's an uh, an interesting point to make. It is. Um, so on that note, um, Jonathan, it was really great to uh, yeah. let's do the high five. Yeah, because <laughs> you can't do that, folks, with CGI. You can't no. do that with, uh, you know, we're actually here in person, which is really nice because normally we have to talk on the computer and um, we don't see each other as much in person anymore. So it was nice to make a, a day of this and go and, uh, go and see Napoleon in the cinema together. We haven't been to see a film together, I think, in the yonks. probably like long, like before COVID, I would have thought. Definitely before actually. COVID, yeah. Yeah, so, so it was nice to do that, and it was nice to sit in person and have a beer and have a chat yeah. about the film, and uh, uh, that's been really nice. And so, yeah. folks, let us know what you think about this, like about us talking about a brand new film, a bit of, uh, you know, current uh, affairs reportage is what we've been doing today. So this is something a bit different from what we normally do. So please let us know, drop us a comment or, uh, you know, leave a review and let us know what you thought about this, doing stuff like this, because, you know, we could do it again another time, maybe. Absolutely. And uh, that'd be cool. And uh, definitely um, come back and see us in a couple of weeks because we've got, I, I say this every time, but, but I only say it because it's true. And the truth is, we've got some really interesting shows coming up. We've got some really interesting uh, guests that we're lining up for the show, some interesting themes. And uh, we're also going into the holidays, so uh, we've got some uh, sort of tentative plans around uh, around the holidays that you might want to watch out for. And, yep. uh, and also, uh, you know, we hope to be back with the factoids very soon. We yep. were just talking about that while we were having dinner. Yep. Uh, so watch out for our, and, uh, in YouTube and our other social media channels for other things that will be coming up. Um, and thanks very much for listening. And please, uh, wherever you are in the world, um, take care of yourself and uh, come back and join us again in a couple of weeks where we'll be talking about more great films. Definitely. So until then, bye for now. Goodbye. We'll see you later. Oh, that's the thing these nerdy middle-aged men get up to. Oh. Oh.